read our scripture. Let's pray. Lord, as we read your word today, we ask that you would move on our hearts so we might understand your word. And help us, Lord, to be doers as well as hearers of it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. First from Isaiah, chapter 56, starting with verse 3. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, The Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple its laws a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And then from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, starting with verse 12. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. There was a, a, a man who spoke to his wife and said, You know, dear, your mother's lived with us for 20 years. Don't you think it's maybe about time that she you know, finds yeah. a place of her own? And she looked at him and said, My mother? I thought she was your mother. <laughs> Jokes oftentimes uh, rely on something unexpected to make us laugh. Uh, so the unexpected can be good or it can be bad. Uh, sometimes the unexpected can cause us to be fearful. Sometimes it can cause us to uh, even be angry sometimes. And Jesus, as we, as we often say, most often in his life does the unexpected. He takes everything and turns it upside down on his head. And in doing so, he brings blessings to, to people but also people, depending on where they come from, can be fearful or even angry with it, as we see in today's scripture. Uh, just before today's scripture, Jesus has ridden into Jerusalem in what we call a triumphal procession. And in doing so, he fulfilled prophecy about how the Messiah would enter into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey pole. The, the Gospel of Matthew in particular shows us uh, Jesus fulfilling one prophecy after another. Prophecies that were spoken Hundreds and hundreds of years before that point in time, Jesus fulfilled one after another. Matthew is particular in showing us he fulfilled this one, he fulfilled this one, he fulfilled this one. And writing into Jerusalem was, was one of those. Uh, and so once he does that, he does something completely unexpected, but also something that fulfills Scripture. Uh, he goes to the temple, which of course is the center of Jerusalem, the center of, of faith in that day for the Jewish people. And he braids a cord uh, made out of, of raw hide uh, into a whip. And then he uses that whip to drive out money changers and merchants who are selling doves and other things there in the temple. Now, there's a lot of uh, speculation as to why he does that. You know, some people say, well, the, the merchants and the money changers were taking advantage of people. They may have been doing that. You know, it's kind of like when you go down to the beach. Uh, and everything's a lot more expensive there because they know they got you. You can't go anywhere else. It's kind of that way at the temple. There's only one temple you want to go to, so you have to pay their price. And they may well have been doing that. They may have been ripping people off. And Jesus causes a den of thieves, a den of robbers. But there's another reason Jesus does what he does. It's based on the scriptures that he quotes and is a fulfillment of those scriptures. Uh, when Jesus is driving out the money changers and, and the merchants, uh, he quotes two passages of scripture. He uses one phrase, and he covers both passages. 
we got to remember, you know, those people in those days knew their scriptures to the point that all you had to do was mention a phrase and the whole passage came to mind. It's like if I were to say to you, coat of many colors, what does that bring to mind? Joseph. And you remember the whole story of Joseph at that point. So it's kind of that way with him. You mentioned a passage of scripture, the whole thing came to mind. Well, Jesus, when he drove out the money changers and merchants, he said to them, uh, quoting God, saying, saying uh, my house is supposed to be a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of robbers. Now, the first part of that about the house being a house of prayer is a prophecy that comes from the prophet Isaiah, which we read this morning. Uh, and then the second part of that comes from Jeremiah, where he says, but you've turned it into a den of robbers. That is a passage that Jeremiah speaks. Now, Jeremiah, when he was speaking in his day and saying that God was saying, you've turned my house into a den of robbers, he was speaking in particular about the way the people of Israel as a whole were acting. He wasn't talking about merchants there, you know, in place selling doves or whatever. He was talking about how, and he mentions it all around this passage of Scripture, as I said, they would recall the whole thing, uh, about how the people of Israel were abusing one another. You know, they were fighting and feuding and stealing from one another, killing each other. They were particularly abusing the, the most weak among them. You know, in the Scripture, you often hear the phrase, widows, orphans, and strangers. And that phrase is often used to denote you know, the people who were most at risk in the society because those were the folks in that day and time who were the most at risk. They had no one to look out for them, no family to be a part of them. And so those were folks who were at risk. And so uh, Jeremiah was saying that God was saying to the people of Israel, you come to my temple, you make God sacrifices, you go through the rituals, but then you turn around and treat people this way and think everything's okay. And God says, no, you turn everything into a house of robbers because you're out robbing these people. And he says, basically, get your life straight before you come to the temple. And the people would remember all that in the second half of what Jesus said. Now, the first half of what Jesus says is fulfillment of the passage that we just read from Isaiah. And in that passage from Isaiah, uh, when, when God says, my house will be a house of prayer, they would remember again the whole passage. And the passage says, the ending there is a house of prayer for all nations. And they would have remembered that as well. That was a messianic, messianic fulfillment of prophecy that that would happen. If you remember, the temple was for who? Who was the temple for? Our people. Jewish people, for Israel. Other nations were pagan nations. They had their own gods and goddesses and systems of religion and worship. And so they would not have been allowed into the temple. The temple was only for people, Jewish people, who worshiped the God of Israel. The temple itself had a number of courts to it uh, that went from one that most anybody could enter into and it kept restricting it until he got to the Holy of Holies where only the high priest could go in. The outer court was called the court of Gentiles and everybody could come there. Uh, and that's what Jesus clean, cleans out when he goes there and tips over the tables and goes to the money changers out. There's a sign at the edge of the court of Gentiles that tells Gentiles this is as far as you can go. If you go further in, your death is on your own head. Because it's basically saying, you know, if you go further, it's death sentence for you. They could only go that far. The next court was the court of women, and that was as far as women of Israel could go. You could be an Israelite and go that far, but women could go no further. The next court was the court of priests. The men of Israel could go there. That's where the altar was and the sacrifices took place. But they could go no further. The next was the holy place, and only priests on duty could go in there. And then you had the Holy of Holies that only the high priest could go in once a year. So you can see it was very highly restricted as to who could go where. But the Messianic prophecy says that my house will be called a house of prayer for all people. And if you remember what I read, the scriptures all around that is talking about the foreigners and the eunuchs. These are people who would have been banned from the temple. But Jesus is saying, no longer. When the Messiah comes, God's gates are thrown open, and there's no need anymore for uh, these restrictions because the Messiah is here. Overturning the money changers tables and, and the merchants and all that, you know, those were necessary for the sacrificial system to provide the sacrifices to exchange worldly money for temple money so that they could give temple money for their donations. They wouldn't give, you know, money that's been sullied out of the world to the temple. That's what all that was for. When Jesus overturned all those tables, he was saying to them, that system is done. You don't need it anymore. Jesus himself is the lamp that takes away the sin of the world. When the Messiah has come, then that will be done away with. Jesus is now uh, the Lamb of God. Jesus is the sacrifice. And then also, it's no longer just restricted for particular people. It's open to anybody who will come to Jesus. 
and that's what he's doing in this temple. He has thrown it open, and, and now the day of Jubilee is here. He was proclaiming the day of the Messiah was there. That was a huge announcement for him to be making. Even the children recognize what's going on because they're running around saying this is the day of Jubilee and they're crying out, Hosanna, son of David, which is a way of their proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah. They knew what Jesus was doing. So too did the high priest and the, and the religious lawyers who made their living around the temple. They knew what Jesus was doing and they were not happy. Uh, they were like going up to Jesus saying, do you hear what these children are saying? Basically, didn't. tell them to stop that. Uh, those religious leaders are what you might call gatekeepers. That was their job. Their job was to be a gatekeeper. There's a who can go in, who can't go in, who gets to do this, who can't do that. And that was their job. Uh, but they were no longer needed at that point because the Messiah had come and restrictions were lifted and all could come in. And uh, that is what is meaningful for us today because we would have been banned from the temple. We're not Jewish folks. You know, we weren't born into the people of Israel. We were all Gentiles. Our ancestors were too, I think, probably for the most part. Uh, so we would have been banned from the temple. But we are allowed to come in because the Messiah has thrown open the gate. And now anybody who comes will come and be a part of the people of God. It doesn't matter who they are. As that scripture from Isaiah says, you know, the people who were banned the most were the foreigners and the eunuchs. Those are particularly banned in the scripture. No longer are they banned, according to that, that passage from Isaiah. And so too, no longer are we. Uh, no longer is anybody who comes to the Lord. The gates are open to everybody. And so gatekeepers are not needed anymore. Now, you've always got those folks out there who want to be gatekeepers. You know, they, they feel like God has appointed them to be the gatekeeper. Uh, but they really have nothing to say you know, to us. Uh, they can't keep us out of the temple and away from God. Only the Lord can do that, and he has opened the gates for us. And so that is what we should be going out of the world telling people, is that great good news that the gates have been thrown open. There's nothing standing between people and God. The Lord is there. Uh, he will take care of, of you know, our sins and sinfulness, whatever is there that may keep us from God. And we can approach God in Christ Jesus. And that is great good news. A promise fulfilled from God. Prophecies fulfilled from God that Jesus fulfilled. And thanks be to God. Does that make sense? Just me. I kind of shot from the hip rather than reading it this way. But hopefully it makes sense today. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have thrown open the gates to the temple to all of us, that we are no longer restricted from you, that in Christ Jesus we're able to approach, and in his shed blood we're forgiven, and they will cry out before you as the very children of God that you have made us to be. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us into your family, and help us, Lord, to go into the world and witness to others that they, too, may become part of your family. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray.